Uh, just wanted to keep this at a fairly high level because I know you all come at it from different perspectives. I'm going to guess we have small counties and some that are larger, and funding is probably proportional to that. So there are a lot of things that we can talk about and do uh, that might still be able to target uh, the things that you need to do and, and can help others understand what you're doing and uh, make the uh, greatest inroads. Um, so a little bit first about Salt Lake Community College. Let me uh, get go over here. Uh, Salt Lake Community College has uh, seven campuses, five centers and sites, and a combination of leased and owned buildings. So maybe a lot of similarities there. Um, we're at about two and a half million gross square feet in our building. Uh, that continues to increase. Uh, we have 411 acres that we're responsible for at those locations. So uh, that'll just give you a bit of a feel for where we're at. Our department has about uh, 115 full-time staff, about 125 part-time staff, and that's valley-wide. Our service area is Salt Lake County, so uh, that's, that's the human resources that we have to deal with, basically. Um, if you take a look at our locations, we're spread from north, northwest is our farthest north location. At the airport, we have an airport center and our new West Point campus off by 215. And then we come all the way down to the south end and we're expanding shortly into the Harriman area. So uh, we'll, we'll embellish that presence on the southwest portion of the valley. We opened a, a small center in the old Harriman City Hall uh, last year. It was very successful. And that's uh, in anticipation to get a running start on what will we plan to do in the Airman area. Um, so, as an institution, we have about 120 programs to study. Our average class size is about 20. Uh, head count, about 61,000 students per year touch our facilities. Uh, that's it's a pretty good amount. 56% uh, of our students are first generation. So they've never been in a college setting before, nor have their uh, parents. So that's a pretty impressive thing that we're pulling that many students into higher education uh, for the first time in their family's history. And 70% of our students are employed. We're very different than the other campuses and institutions in that our students are very commuter oriented. They come and take a class, go to work. Many times they'll come back and take another class and go back home and study. So we have no housing other than one small facility just straight west of here that houses cadets for the police officer standard training facility. So besides that, we have no housing. A little bit about uh, the looks of and what we try to accomplish. This is a shot of the needs of our Taylorville Redwood campus. So you can kind of get a feel for our facilities. We try to pay attention to materials and spaces inside and out uh, the, so that we can make those uh, conducive to teaching and effective teaching and learning. Uh, this is our oldest facility built in actually 29, uh, This is the old South High School on State Street, about 17 South. Uh, we, we purchased that from Salt Lake City School District in 1989, 88, somewhere in there. And uh, have since done a number of remodels on it. We paid a million dollars for the building and uh, kept the original building intact. Surprisingly, it's one of our most energy efficient buildings because uh, we, we did do a window replacement and uh, re-roof and re-insulate, but the, the sheer mass of the building, it's, it's hard to get it off course temperature-wise. 
So in the summer, once you get it cool, you can coast. In the winter, once you get it heated, you can coast. So kind of surprising that a 1930 building is one of our uh, best EUI buildings, energy use index. Another shot of one of our buildings that elaborated our Marcosian campus. I don't know if some of you have the same challenges, but every building we build that's funded from the state has to incorporate 1% for the arts. So we have to deal with that on almost every major project that we have, which is a good thing. Uh, we have some wonderful artwork in our uh, collection at Salt Lake Community College. We try to pay a lot of attention to outdoor spaces. This is the quad area that uh, we've recently redone and tried to be a little bit more water-wise. There's escaping and uh, people places, places that people want to hang out and be. Uh, so a little fountain, this is the fountain splash pad in the middle. As you're aware, splash pads and pools present their own fun. Uh, if you haven't dealt with those, you're missing out. So. Another piece of artwork, this is at our Jordan campus at our high tech center. So just wanted to give you a feel for Salt Lake Community College and uh, what we have to deal with. So first of all, I'd like you to get your arms around the big picture. What are you managing? What's your responsibility? Uh, do you all know what your responsibility is? And where you need to go with that? I think that's critical that you understand exactly what's expected of you. If, if you don't know what your expectation is, is for management you're probably spinning your wheels. Um, expectations change, I, I do acknowledge that, but going in on the front end, you have to know what what level of cleanliness, what level of stateliness <coughs> on your grounds. What's what's the expectation on snow removal? Uh, you need to premeditate all that and, and factor that into everything that you do. Uh, otherwise, it's tough. Then identify your resources. What are your resources, both physical, monetarily? Um, how many people do you have that you can throw up issues and still, if you have an emergency issue, can you still maintain operations in your, in your other areas to a level that's not going to detract from your overall service uh, front uh, picture or your face, if you will. Um, Understanding those resources on the front end. And then zero in on exactly what you, what you are managing. Uh, so many outside, outwardly period things have many hidden components. Uh, so a building, for example, all of the infrastructure that goes along with the building to support the operation and, and function of that building. Uh, you have to keep those in mind. So uh, understand what you're managing, all of those buildings and their components. How many of you have utility distribution systems? Do you feed through central plants or? Okay, that, that's a challenge for us. Is uh, we have three campuses that have central distribution plants for chilled water, steam or hot water, electric, natural gas, culinary water. It's IT, 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 it is all contained in the tunnel system. So uh, that's, that's a uh, component that we have to really pay a lot of attention to. And then how many of you are responsible for scheduling over your facility? Yeah, that's a challenge in and of itself as well. Um, Try to be energy efficient and, and wise with your resources, yet meet the demands of the schedule. It's tough. Um, if you try to shut things down for a period of time, then maybe you can serve some energy. Yet every three hours you have a new group coming in to use the space. So you're, you're wasting your time to try to shut down, really, because by the time you do, you've got to get back up and be ready for the next group. We find that all the time in classes, so we made a real concerted effort to start to condense. Even in buildings for the summer, we're going to try to uh, use some buildings much less in the summer and basically shut them down on Fridays because Friday is a really slow day for us. So that's one, one idea you might think about is uh, 
scheduling, how you can leverage that. How many of you have responsibilities for paving? Parking lots, roadways, yeah, okay. So be aware of that. Any runways? Any of you have responsibility for runways or tarmac areas? That's a whole challenge in and of itself as well because you enter into federal regulations and those challenges become uh, pretty, pretty heavy. Uh, we talked a little bit about infrastructure on your service utilities, um, site utilities. At some point, you pick up where the utility company stops and uh, you have to provide for that. That's a challenge, always a challenge, but be aware of that. How many of you have grounds responsibility? Yeah, pretty common. Um, just understanding what that level of expectation is with grounds is half the battle. Um, what, I don't know who you answer to, but if it's commissioners or uh, county manager or ultimately, who's gonna, who's gonna look at those grounds and say that this is where we need to be, that's what our expectation is. Understand that, then you can react to it. Um, any others that you can think of I left out? Probably some. Uh, higher ed is a little bit unique in that uh, some of the things we do don't translate directly to uh, municipalities and counties, but many, many similarities. So, um, talk again about expectation. So, how many of you have thought about the life cycle of your assets? How do you get your arms around what that expected life cycle is? That's always a challenge. You know, if, uh, if somebody comes to me and says, well, we don't want to spend that kind of money on whatever, you know, I'm sure you hear that all the time. That's okay, but no, <laughs> that you're gonna pay for that sooner than you would otherwise. If you're gonna probably take the least expensive route on the front end. That's that's great as long as everybody understands that whatever that asset is, you're going to have to try to stretch it and baby it along at some point, and it's going to have to be more frequently dealt with, right? We all have projects that come along and you get a non-preferred. I don't know. Let's talk about pumps. How many of you have a favorite pump that you use? We do. We know what works and what doesn't work. So. Our guys will come in all the time and say, man, we're going to be replacing the seals on that pump four times a year. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, we have to competitive what we did like you guys do, and sometimes that's what you end up with. But at least we know that on the front end. That's half the battle. Are we going to just run the failure, or are we going to try to maintain it? That's always a big question. So think about your assets. Uh, bathroom exhaust fan. Are you going to mess with that much? Probably not. Uh, if you look at a smaller exhaust fan out of the restroom, you're going to run into failure. Because there are no parts to service, typically. No belts, no motors other than the main drive motor. And it's probably integral with the fan, right? You, you can't mess with that. And it's not worth your time to mess with it. Go buy another $75 fan and replace it. Don't spend the time to try to maintain it. Keep the grill clean because that's whoever you answer to, that's what they're going to see, is that they're collecting on the exhaust of the grill, right? So that's fine, as long as we know that going in. Um, try, to, try, try to explain the first cost may not always be the best indicator of the quality of whatever you're trying to do uh, for the longevity of what you're trying to accomplish with your facility. And then, what is the standard of care? So for custodial, we use a national standard. Uh, through our national organization that we use, APA, is the Association of Physical Plant Administrators, and they publish standards for uh, level of expectation. So I tell our administration all the time, we are at a level three, which is ordinary tidiness. It's not immaculate. You don't want to eat off the floor, but it's clean. It's serviceable. People are comfortable at that level of care. Yet we don't spend an inordinate, inordinate net amount of time uh, at detail work all the time. We 
do you do deep cleaning at break time between semesters or holidays or whatever? We, we do go in and do deep cleaning, but we don't do that on a routine basis. And our, our administration knows that going in. So um, everybody's happy with that. The other piece is mission critical. Data centers, anybody have data centers? We do. Yeah. There's no argument about data centers. They have to be uh, baked. You can't take risk of losing those. Uh, we were down two days last week. And it's still registration for summer term. And we don't know how many students we lost in that two days. We, we're still trying to evaluate that. But if, if you get customers or your constituents coming to expect your service and can't get access to it so much as online these days, you, you, they're lost. They're gone somewhere else. They're doing something else. Uh, so I, I don't like to call students customers, but technically they are. And uh, we need to meet those needs. So mission critical equipment is something that we think about a lot. And then things that are politically significant. Can any of you relate to that? So we we have a president's residence adjacent to our Taylor Hill campus for a long time. And it was in a neighborhood setting, uh, but it connected to the campus. So do you think the appearance of that was politically significant? It's sure. Sure, that place had to be immaculate all the time. Yet, a daycare center that fronts on River Grove or some other facility out in the way would probably get a little bit lower standard of care. But at that time, the president was entertaining dignitaries and legislators and you name it at that residence. And so we had to keep that appearance up because of the political significance. Talk a little bit more about resources. So what are they? We talked a little bit about the uh, human resources, your staff. How do you use your staff most effectively? That's a real balancing act. Uh, how do you keep them engaged and supportive of your mission? That's a real challenge. Uh, we spent a lot of time in training and explaining uh, why we do what we do. I think our staff understands that pretty well. Um, operation maintenance funding and your day-to-day -day expenditures, are you all familiar with that concept? Uh, I don't know your funding sources. Uh, ours are dictated legislatively. So we build a new building, we get X dollars per square foot, depending on the type of space. So it's between, right now, between $8 and $10 a square foot, depending on the maintenance and density of that space. And that's to cover everything. That's utilities, ongoing, uh, custodial, any day-to-day -day consumables, filters, belts, things like that. We have to make sure we take out of that operation of the maintenance amount. Some of the traps we fall into there is you start doing other things with your operation and maintenance. Somebody will come in and say, oh, I need a new data guy, so that's a big one. They'll come in and say, this room's too hot. You know, we used to get that all the time when, when, when uh, racks first thing came out, and they would put routers on these racks, and they start putting them in every closet. Can you relate to that? Every little closet would have IT stuff in it. Then they come to you and say, it's too hot, they're burning up. We need to put in a, a DX unit to cool that closet. Okay, so we have the understanding right at that time that's your DX unit, not mine. Because the building wasn't built with that. So when it dries, you're going to pay for it. Early on, they found out it was cheaper to replace the router with the current up than it was to pay for their HVDC. That's changed now, but early on, they came to the realization pull it out of the rack, throw it away, go plug it in the new one. It's 90 bucks, it's cheaper than paying for that HVC unit. So you, you just keep that in mind that uh, uh, O&M funding is for a very specific purpose. Repair and replacement funding is a different matter. We're funded separately for that. So 
uh, our capital improvement process uh, is annual. We make requests for roof, paving, masonry restoration, window upgrades, you name it. We request that through a separate channel. So we don't intermix with the O&M funding piece. I have to tell our people all the time, guard your own m money. Don't cross over and start using it for other stuff or your quality starts to deteriorate. For many years, um, I don't know why I have it on this slide, but I don't. One thing, when I first started at the college, I've been there 30 years, and uh, about 10 years into it, I had to talk. Well, I got funded for these buildings back in the 60s and 70s, X dollars per square foot. At the time, it was probably two or three dollars. But the considerable piece, I've never had an increase in the current expense. So we get wage increases. That comes from the legislature. All of the other piece of utilities, they increase. Easy to make a case for that. You can pay the bill or you don't need to cool your building, right? You don't pay the water bill or check them off. Maybe some of you are the water company, I don't know. But anyway, we were existing on old built on new buildings. So we were subsidizing our old buildings with our new funding from uh, new buildings. Does that make sense? So if we're getting today 10 bucks a square foot, eight bucks, whatever. We were subsidizing that two or three dollar per square foot building and diluting that new amount. And so it had, I, I dug into it and it had been 20 years since anybody in higher ed had a, had an increase in current expense. So we made a case, one, they said, yeah, I didn't see that. So we were able to get an increase there and bring some of that back up. But be aware of where your money's going, I guess is my point. Uh, watch, watch those pennies because they add up quickly. Um, resources, other resources, consultants. We we use a lot of consultants. Uh, they help us a lot. They all have a, a level of expertise and an area of expertise that we don't have on our staff. So we, we find ourselves using consultants quite a bit to evaluate things like uh, we're hiring a paper right now to give us a five-year plan. I want to know which parking lots I've got to replace in two or three or four years so I can request those uh, asphalt, you know, if you maintain it well. If you build it well, first of all, uh, get some slope on it, do it right, get the right paving section, maintain it well, crack seal, flurry. Uh, it'll, it'll give you a lot of years, but at some point, you gotta bite the bullet and start to resurface. And then you have to make that choice. Am I gonna mill it, overlay it, or am I gonna tear it out and replace it? So anyway, um, we're trying to develop a five-year plan right now so that I can project what our costs are gonna be along those lines shortly. Um, contractors are a great resource. And then they all have a specialty niche, so we pick their brain all the time. Our custodial supplier is waxy. Any of you use waxy products? So, waxy offers a service you may not know about, but we send all of our custodial crew through training through waxy. They have a training room at their Salt Lake uh, Center there, and we've actually had them certified in different areas, and it was all free. Waxy said, "Sure, we'll set that up." So, our reps set that up with their people and did different trainings on various machines, different surfaces was free and our people are much more valuable to us once they have that set of skills um, so take a, take advantage of those resources if you can um, interns we have a couple of programs at the college the civil engineering uh, energy management and uh, uh, architectural program that we pull interns in all the time there relatively inexpensive, you know, you can pay a decent hour of wage for summer work, and you get a lot of those specialty projects taken care of if you use interns. Plus it gives them the experience that they need. Uh, it's just a good resource there. Uh, software is a big one. Um, how many of you are going down the new path with your deliverables on your buildings and facility? So, uh, Revit is very powerful. 
we're starting to use that more and more to do more of our front end work within the building model rather than uh, identifying that later. So most of you will get a uh, operation and maintenance manual on your sub as built at the end of the project. So we're we're making the contractor and the architectural consultant and his consultants reflect all of those in the deliverable BIM model. So we can re we can basically sort that database and pull the items out of that BIM model and insert them into our computer maintenance management system without having to do it manually. Does that make sense? So a van unit or some specialty unit is we just plunk it right into our computer computerized maintenance management system, our work order system. Uh, and then we assign the attributes recommended by the manufacturer for preventing maintenance work. So we do the frequency, our preventing maintenance work order spit out on whatever that frequency is. And uh, it's all centrally located. We know what it costs on the front end. We know what day it was installed. We know what the expected life of it is. We know what's been serviced, what hasn't. And when we do visit that piece of equipment, we know what our technicians are supposed to be doing when they go visit that piece of equipment. We've barcoded every piece of equipment so that when they hit whatever that is, they scan it. It pops up on their device. They can look at that history on site. So you don't have to go back and dig through an archive room or set of ass built drawings or an OIN manual. It's all there in the system. Does that make sense? That's, that's a pretty good tool, and we're by no means deep, deep on that, but we're making some really good inroads right now. GIS systems, same way, they're so powerful. Uh, many of you have uh, any drone work done, GIS drone work. It's, it's amazing what you can do on a Sunday morning with a fixed wing drone and a rotary wing drone in the inventory of your facilities and your sites. You can get more information than you'll ever use, uh, and it's cheap. Uh, we used to do aerials all the time. Traditional hire an aerial survey company, fly it on Sunday morning at all of our sites. <laughs> we did every campus with drones. More information than we ever got from the aerial uh, for a third of the cop, I'd say. So very powerful. Uh, we're probably going to be in the drone business ourselves before too long. The thing that sold me was the infrared capability. So I envision our ground foreman going out in the morning, launching the aerial drone with the IR camera, scanning his grounds, and you can see every dry spot, every wet spot. Uh, I mean, you can just see that temperature differential it just pops out at you. If you've got a major leak on your irrigation system, You'll, you'll know it that quick, just through that temperature differential. So lots of good tools that you can use and lots of stuff coming down the pipe. Um, I talked a little bit about our CMMS system. We use a product called Sprocket. It's a, it's a product of Dematic Corporation. Dematic is an automated uh, storage retrieval to base with this, but they also delve deeply into this type of software. And, so it's very powerful, and we're making as much use of that as we can to save, save our folks a lot of footsteps and uh, uh, as much time as possible. We run our work orders through that, as I mentioned, as well as our preventive maintenance work orders, and we have record of that, and uh, it works out uh, very well. Another area that we fight all the time are buildings. So then if you separately built for services. If you have an outside group in the space, uh, that's pretty easy to do. But when you have an internal group that is supposed to be self-supporting, in, in effect, our students, uh, they, they operate their facilities under auxiliaries, which are not state funded. They're totally funded from, from student fees. So we have to be careful if athletics says, okay, we're gonna use a building on such and such a day. Or if Athletics says we're going to do a basketball camp on such and such a day, we have to be careful that uh, we 
give them the support that they need, but that is a different we build. Uh, so we take care of that within our CMMS system as well. We have those rates, hourly rates and space rates built into our system, so it's easy to compile that bill and give it to the user. We take, we track our exception time as well. So vacation sick leave, community service leave, those types of things we track in our CMMS system and then we feed them to our overarching enterprise system. So we also track how much time it took to, how much wrench time it took to fix whatever they were working on or they were building something at the cabin shop or whatever, we track that as well. But the big piece there is our exception time which is exported out of the work order system into the enterprise system so they get paid. Uh, that, was, that was a major hurdle for us and we we're, were there, all of there. Um, hierarchy, I'll talk about that again in a second, another slide that probably better describes that. Space inventory software, we're using that frequently where we have to do an annual space report of uh, occupancy and uh, how much square footage we're using per student. That's our funding mechanism. FTE is based on a button up seat for that many hours. That, you know, that's, that's what it boils down to. How many people do you have in that seat and how many hours? And that's how you fund it for the legislature. Uh, tuition is a weird thing because we don't get the tuition. The tuition is given to the state for the most part. And then back to us on that funding, based on that funding formula. So we have to pay a lot of attention to that, to the space requirements. Um, it also helps us to look at our building replacement schedule, similar to what I described in the parking lots. I want to project which buildings are, have reached their useful life. We need to get rid of those. Do we need to do a major repair and renovation of those buildings? Uh, we have to make those decisions based on uh, the data that we have at hand. So, um, how many of you partner with your utility providers? Uh, Rocky Mountain Power services us electrically at all of our sites. They're a great resource. Uh, some of the energy and city stuff is amazing. We actually have a full time energy manager on our staff that is fully funded through self directed credits from Rocky Mountain Power. Salary and benefit. So those kind of resources are there and all you have to do is ask. So uh, in addition to the normal incentives that you're probably all mostly aware of. You know, if you deal with munis municipality provided services, not so much. But uh, between Dominion and Rocky Mountain we play that all we can. It, it boils down to a lot of money. Um, grants, we have people writing grants for us all the time. Our most current was to get, uh, I think we got six electric vehicle charging station program that were a minimum amount to us. We had to pay for the installation, but they're up and going. And uh, so that was our first foray into EV charging station. And it's just, they're full all the time. So, it, any of you familiar with how they're set up, uh, the software, the background? So, these, this brand that we settled on is, has uh, basically a cell phone inside it. Communicates data like back with their central software. So, we program it so that you pull into an electric vehicle stall, you get two hours free. You hit one second after that two hours, you get them down. It's like five bucks every 10 minutes. So we have people standing up there with phone timers. <laughs> and they have to get they have to vacate the stall and you'll have somebody waiting to pull in that stall as soon as they're out. They have this little informal network. They communicate via text and say, I'll be out of there in five minutes, pull your car in. It's amazing uh, how popular this has become. But we we had to do that to keep rotation. Otherwise somebody would just camp in there and charge constantly. And it just didn't work for us. So just a little uh, tidbit there you can maybe use someday. Um, peer experiences. I mentioned, I mentioned that, but uh, our, our peer institutions share that. 
and APA maintains a database called the Facility Performance Indicator. We feed information into that every year, and then by doing so, we're allowed to go in and query that database and benchmark against other institutions. And we can select who we want to benchmark against. It doesn't do me any good to benchmark against the University of Utah. We're not. They're in the different way. But I can sure benchmark against Portland Community College. And I can sure benchmark against uh, Cuyahoga Community College. I mean, there, there are community colleges all around the country and districts that are very similar to us in size and scope. That I can say, okay, how many ground people do you have here? It's in there. I just look at it and say, okay, they make it work. Here's their level of expectation. Here are ours. And I find that we're very much within alignment of our peer institutions. You guys can share that information as well. Uh, I don't know if there are organizations nationally that you belong to that have that type of resource, but it's one of the better things we've done and uh, it's paid big dividends for us. Um, I mentioned the hierarchy. I just wanted to show you. So in our CMMS system, this is our South City campus and we're looking at some pieces of equipment here. I think why is this number? Somewhere other equipment actually has a good number attached to this, but I can glance at that number and tell you 300 is South City Campus. And I can tell you 301 is our main building at South. And then if we have the room number in this next column, I can tell you which room that piece of equipment was in. These all happen to be in our central plant, so uh, they're not in there. So uh, it's just understood that that's the room that they're in. But, you can see kind of our hierarchy within our CMNS system. And so we even go down into that pump's probably going to be a parent of a motor. That makes sense. So if I kept drilling down into this, I'm going to have one more branch here that shows the motor that goes to that pump. And it's a child of that parent. And that's the way our work order system broken down. So you can just see that kind of cascading effect. Very valuable to, to track your equipment that way. So if you ever set up a CMMS system, make sure you pay a lot of attention to that hierarchy because it can be a very powerful tool at some point. Um, this is just a screenshot of some of the benchmarking that I mentioned. So this one happens to be FTE. So I can do an inquiry for any number of FTE. And so I just built this one quickly. So I benchmarked against Portland, Johnson County, Cuyahoga, Casper, which is relatively small in the area. Um, so I can just see the comparison in FTE. Um, I mentioned 61,000 headcount. That equates to 13,000 FTE. Um, but you can see that Cuyahoga is much larger FTE wise than we are. And Portland, way larger than we are. Uh, you can see Johnson County is pretty close. So I can benchmark against Johnson County pretty well, knowing that they have a similar number of students. Gross score feet, same thing. I can just sort the gross score feet and do a quick comparison. You can see, again, Portland, well, we're not in that. I talk to my parents in Portland weekly. We compare notes a lot. Uh, so you can kind of see how you compare based on gross square feet that you maintain. Uh, number of buildings owned, you can see where we're at 42. Portland's a little higher at 61. They have a lot of little buildings downtown. I don't know if you're familiar with their campuses, but you can see we're right on par with Cuyahoga at 42. And if you remember, our FT was fairly low. So it makes sense. It aligns. We can, we can know pretty much what we're, you know, if we're comparing apples to apples by that. The building age range is a big factor. The older your facilities are, more maintenance and pits are important. So, um, let's wrap up real quick. Uh, just pose some questions that you might want to ask yourself. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, how are you managing your assets? Get your arms around what you're managing and how you're managing them. And how are you managing your resources? They're finite, be it financial or human. 
you, you only have so many resources. Take advantage of the software resources. They can be very powerful and assist you in your efforts. Uh, we found that uh, firsthand. So. And then the most important thing, I, in my opinion, is share this information with those who are making the decision. Communicate regularly with them so that they understand what you're dealing with. A lot of times they make assumptions. And if you don't, uh, we're horrible to our own home and our facility services division. We just, I don't know what it is. We, you know, academic guys are out there. We did this, we did that. We just do our stuff, do our thing. We're quiet, you know. So it's been hard for us. We have to force ourselves to tell our story and share that information with our uh, leadership. But they, they do understand when they take a certain effort to do that. So, with that, be the most effective that you can using those tools. Okay? Any questions? I know that was quick and free, but uh, I didn't want to drill down too deep. I wanted to keep it a high level because I, I don't know what, yeah, I'm sure you're, you're all unique in your responsibilities. So, hopefully, that was helpful. Um, anything I can answer based on what we do? Or What's the budget of Salt Lake County Community? Budget? Salt Lake Community College budget. Facility service? Overall? Whatever. Uh, to where's the, where's the biggest component, by the way? Yes. Uh, I think it's about 200 million. Yeah, right in that range. Yeah. We have about a half a billion dollars worth of buildings that we insure for. And uh, about a hundred million dollars worth of content. So I don't know if that helps. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. All right, we ran a little long, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let you get over and, and get your lunch. It's in the next room. Bring your lunch back here. If you absolutely have to go because we did run a little bit long, there's there's to-go boxes over there that you can load up. Um, plenty of food, but um, if you can stay, why don't you come on back with your lunch?